Yeah. Got, everyone got their sodas, caffeine, it's the last push. Um, yeah, so my talk is just going to be a quick overview of this upcoming project for this summer. Um, I thought I'd start off with a little, a few fun facts. Hummingbirds are called hummingbirds because of the sound their wings make. And thankfully, actually, for some of the species that are common in our area, uh, that sound, that specific humming sound can be uh, species specific and actually can aid in uh, identification, which will be helpful for us who are working on this project. Um, they flap their wings 12 to 80 times per second. And they're the only bird that can fly backwards. Their heart rate is an astonishing 1,000 beats per minute. And at night, when, and also when food is uh, scarce, they are able to go into a torpor, a state of torpor, and, and slow that heart rate down to about 100 beats per minute. Um, so I fell in love with hummingbirds, especially this summer. I've always loved birds, but I really geeked out on hummingbirds this summer. It was like a nightly ritual to go home and um, eat dinner on our lawn chairs with a hummingbird feeder right here and watch hummingbirds like, you know, coming in at face level. And I have to thank Corey um, for part of this idea. She was just kind of geeking out with me and, and said, well, maybe you should consider a hummingbird project. And with all the restoration MPG has been doing and, and is slated to do and all the work on native plants and just the, the whole notion of MPG Ranch, I th the more I thought about it, the more it made sense. Um, to do some sort of hummingbird project. And let's not forget, it's right there in our G. <laughs> so a little background information. Hummingbirds are only found in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they play an important ecological role in pollinating plants throughout their range. Um, despite their popularity with humans, little is known about their natural history. Um, and it's been suggested that uh, there's some population declines, possibly in the United States um, and out in our area that would uh, right now be the Rufus hummingbird. So conservation of hummingbird populations may require additional monitoring using methods a little more specific to hummingbirds and their habitats. Um, so I kind of am piggybacking off of um, the National Audubon Society's uh, Citizen Science Project, which they launched uh, last year, but this year um, they've really upped it. They've, they've got a web interface and, and um, have put a lot of work into it. So this is a huge national citizen science project called Hummingbirds at Home. And, and this was also part of the, the uh, catalyst for this program, or for the project at MPG. And they're operating off of these uh, potential issues, that change in climate has the potential to alter the relationships between hummingbirds and plants. Um, research indicates that certain native plants are blooming earlier due to warming temperatures. Changes in plant phenology may affect hummingbird populations, especially during their lengthy spring migration when the availability of nutrients is vital. And hummingbird breeding also coincides with the historical availability of nectar sources. <coughs> For example, um, the broad-tailed hummingbird uh, leaves its wintering grounds in Mexico in May, travels 1,500 miles, and really concentrates uh, around Colorado here, the, the high mountains of Colorado. Um, they have typically arrived and bred in concert with the start of the growing season. And these maps are a little rough, but basically this map over here is showing the start of the growing season, and this map is the breeding distribution of the broad-tailed hummingbird. And, you, and it's just showing how uh, synchronous those, those rela the relationship of the broad-tailed breeding range to the start of the growing season is. But uh, some research has been showing that glacier lilies specifically um, are currently blooming up to 17 days earlier than, than, than they did in the 1970s. And so um, there's folks that are seriously worried that uh, hummingbirds, and specifically here, broad-tailed hummingbirds, may now lack an important food source um, on that spring return. So with this in mind, you, you know, hummingbirds at home have developed this really awesome and easy to use uh, 
um, citizen science project that is tailored towards anyone. I mean, they want as many people to use this as possible. So you can get on this site and you can read more about it. You can, uh, you can see, they've got this uh, interactive map now that, that you can see what, uh, what data is being collected. Um, it's really easy to sign up. They've got a really nice iPhone app and other smartphone app. So um, I, you all may be getting pushes from me at some point to get your own little app and your own little hummingbird feeder at your house. Um, so hummingbirds in Montana, we have seven species of hummingbirds in Montana, uh, three of which are common. And that would be, those would be the rufous, calliope, and black chinned. And this map pretty much works for those three species. Green is their breeding and summer range, with yellow being some sort of uh, you know, migration routes, possibly. Um, there's few records of the four other species, which are the ruby-throated, the annas, costas, and broad-tailed hummingbirds. However, um, places like the Bitterroot Valley actually does routinely see uh, fall visits of annas and costas. Um, so these are some photos of, of the three common species. This is the male rufous hummingbird, thought to be, um, a, well, it is a species of concern, I believe. It's already listed as that, but thought to meet, possibly be declining. It's our easy, most easily recognizable hummingbird out here. Uh, the female of the rufous um, still has a little bit of rufous left. They're pretty big and they're fairly aggressive. Uh, this is a male black-chained hummingbird. And um, in the right light, this color will just shimmer throughout its entire, under its uh, entire throat. Super beautiful. And the female. Uh, these, this species is, can be told by um, when they come up on a feeder or flower, they pump their tail frequently. And then there's the calliope hummingbird, which is uh, our smallest hummingbird. And it's got these awesome uh, gor gorgets that actually um, can, they can f flare out during breeding season. And then the female calliope. And we suspect that these three common species use a variety of uh, habitats in Western Montana. However, most observations come from uh, people with feeders at their home and little if any habitat information is recorded and also, uh, similar to other species in Montana, we see few records um, during spring and fall migration. So uh, we're hoping to boost some of those records of spring and fall migration and also potentially um, get some, some observations of rarely documented, the, the rare, rarely documented uh, hummingbirds like the annas and costas and broad-tailed. And then also hopefully provide a bit of a more complete picture of their uh, life histories of the common species. Um, so on MPG Ranch in the last few years, we've documented their presence uh, incidentally and through some formal surveys, and they appear to be abundant. Uh, in 2010, we invited, uh, or we had Ned and uh, Gigi Batch Elder, who uh, are professional hummingbird banders, and they came out for, um, I think, three banding sessions and uh, oops, banded 17 hummingbirds. Numbers are right here. Uh, this is at the guest house. Um, nothing, it was, they have since moved out of the state, and so we have not done any more banding with them. But um, not too much to note with that visit, except that uh, compared to their other Bitterroot study sites, and, and I think they've got more than just a few, like maybe two dozen other sites at least. Um, MPG had unusually high proportions of the black-chinned hummingbird. Um, and like I said, they moved out of the state. And so right now, Montana actually is kind of lacking with hummingbird banders. It takes a special permit and um, banding license to, to be qualified to ban hummingbirds. The Avian Science Center has also incidentally captured hummingbirds in their mist nets on the northern floodplain um, each year. All of those birds were released without processing because of that permit requirement. Um, this map shows um, 
three years of point count surveys and, and the hummingbird observations or detections from our point count surveys. Not surprising, I guess, that there is a little bit of a gap right through here. Cheat grass, hello. Um, not too much flowering. Um, and then as soon as you get up a little higher near the shrubby draws and bitter brush, um, hummingbirds were detected on basically every habitat type that MPG has, all the way over into Davis Creek. Um, obviously the shrubby, shrubby draws, both deciduous and coniferous. And then interesting were the, the high concentration of observations over on this um, near Woodchuck Creek in the shrubby steep hills off of, uh, off of Woodchuck. Not sure what that's about. Could have just been the right time of year, but. Uh, and then also this last August, I just, um, in between projects, I had a little bit of time, and I wanted to see what I'd find for this upcoming project, see if there was any, anything interesting that popped out. So I just conducted some informal uh, surveys of feeder visitation at the guest house, <clears throat> the top house, and the education garden. Um, all those, the total numbers of, of, of observations between the sites were very similar. I think it was, I had... Uh, 15 at the guest house, 17 at the top house, and 11 at the education garden. Um, it was a little curious to me, the, the lower number of calliope observations, but again, this was only for a month, not um, a high number of uh, surveys done by any means, but um, I also noted that the highest number of observations were from August 12th to the 20th, which is probably a function of fledgling, recently fledged young being around MPG and also early migrants maybe starting to make a push through. So for the actions for this project for this summer, which is starting uh, in a month, less than a month, um, we're going to document hummingbird activity at 20 feeders at different vegetation points across the ranch. Some of those will be established uh, vegetation phenology points that uh, Becca talked about earlier. We're going to conduct weekly surveys from April through November using the iPad application uh, to map these observations. Um, at, at a subset of these locations, we're going to experiment using some cameras uh, to document arrival and departure dates um, and, and hopefully some of those rarer species, which I, I feel like some of those um, are going to show up just based on, um, I, I think not many people, like I said earlier, do hummingbird surveys outside of a house and feeder at a house location. Um, oops, sorry, go back. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna use cameras. We're gonna share all these observations uh, with the Hummingbirds at Home program. Uh, we're gonna enter them to eBird, which also, it all gets tied into the Montana Natural Heritage Program database, sharing it with the state. Um, we're going to promote the heck out of Hungers at Home program to all you. We're going to maybe get some newspaper articles, Facebook, maybe host another, you know, naturalist mercantile, like a how to use Hungers at Home. Um, Hungers are awesome type of stuff. So, I mean, it, the more that we can get out there for hummingbird uh, conservation, and it all, it all ties into to good things when we're, when we're talking about hopefully having people plant more native flowers or just preserving and, and learning more about these awesome little birds. And then this August, I'm going to attend a hummingbird banding training uh, down in Arizona to um, see how, so the hummingbird, net, the hummingbird Monitoring Network operates out of Arizona, and they've been going for many years. They've been doing this for many years, so I'm going to go and, and just pick their brain a little bit and try and work out the kinks in our um, approach and possibly look for some hummingbird experience, uh, banding experience for the future. So this map just shows the proposed feeder survey sites. Those are in white and then I just put up the um, Becca's phenology sites in red just for some comparison and, and also because I think that's going to be a cool tie-in with the data that she's already been collecting and, and it goes right along with, with like the hummingbirds at home program. They want to know are you, do you have a feeder at your survey site? Um, what other, they have a list of native plants you can choose from. Are the hummingbirds visiting those, plant, those plants? Are they in bloom or not? So hopefully tie 
uh, some of these survey sites in with those, with uh, phenology sites. The other sites, the other, I chose them, uh, yeah, based on vegetation type, elevation aspects, um, the, the shrubby draw surveys that us birders are already doing and have been doing, um, some raptor migration sites where we're already at, and just sort of ease of access. But it ended up being spread out across um, the ranch in a way that I, I think for now looks all right. Um, again, this is gonna be a sort of a pilot year and there's gonna be a lot of kinks to work out in the methods and feeder placement. And even things like the logistics of filling feeders and making the hummingbird nectar on a weekly basis is, may have me pulling my hair out. So um, we're gonna use a combination of techniques to observe hummingbird activity at the feeders, like I said, from mid-April through mid-November, hopefully. Um, motion triggered cameras. Uh, we'll perform 15 minute surveys, I think, at each feeder once a week. And uh, we'll use that iPad and then we'll note species, sex, and age when possible. Um, we'll note plant status um, using the methods developed by the Hummingbirds at Home program, which is just simply what plants are present, are they blooming, did the hummingbirds visit them. Uh, I think we'll shoot for like a hundred meter radius of the survey site just because further, and it may be closer than that just based on seeing a little bird that far away. And then we'll base the total number of individuals on spe species, sex, or age attributes and or the maximum number of individuals present at the same time. Because hummingbirds can be coming and going and if you don't know if you're seeing the same one twice, if all of a sudden you have five there, great. Five was the maximum number. Um, because some of the females uh, look alike. And if you get a view of them for one or two seconds, you have no idea what, what bird that was. So with all this in mind, and with this being a pilot project, we're hoping to address some of these questions like, how does hummingbird activity change through the season at individual, individual points? What are hummingbird arrival and departure dates? What are the dyna dynamics of their migration? Does hummingbird abundance and species composition vary by vegetation type? Uh, do they use any features we have provided through restoration activities? Um, what rare hummingbird species occur in the Bitterroot Valley? Which flowers are their nectar sources? Um, and then do we have any correlations between the phenology and um, things like arrival? or departure dates, um, fledgling dates. Um, and in the future down the road, uh, hummingbird banding, is that a possibility? Um, should we look into that? Um, it's, it's a long process, but uh, it could be really fun and there could be some really interesting things that come out of it all. Looking forward to uh, running, just having this first year be um, experimental and, and I really welcome any feedback, questions, um, ideas now, or if you see me out there struggling or hear me struggling or whatever, um, because like I said, it's, uh, it's all gonna be an experiment, so thanks. <laughs>